Last week, we began speaking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. How we have to ask and, and earnestly and be committed in asking the Holy Spirit, what gifts do you have for me? He wants to gift us according to his will and purposes. We want to ask the Holy Spirit, what is my position in the kingdom? And your, our first position is to have a humble heart of worship. In the meantime, while God gives us the gift of healing or whatever it is that he has for us, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, in the meantime, we worship him and we praise him and we wait on him and in him alone. We don't get desperate because this is only on the Holy Spirit to distribute as he seems pleased, as he wishes. And we give that sovereignty, all-knowing position to God and not ourselves. Our position is to remain in the presence of God. No matter the tribulations, the trials that come our way, no matter the victories that come our way, we always give God the glory. Always give God the glory. And so today I want to speak to you about the importance of us, the church, to continue growing in our faith, hope, and love for God and one another. Is our faith, hope, and love for God and each other, the church. Yes, we love God. We have faith in him. We have our hope in him, and, and we, we do all those things for God. But God is also calling us to do the same for our brothers and sisters around us. It's not just, it's not, it's not only up to God or we're, it's only directed to God, it's also directed to his people. That is why we gather on Sundays. That's why we gather for Bible studies. That's why we pray for one another. That is why we come and congregate, as the Bible tells us. Why? Because we have to encourage one another. And the importance of the church to come together and gather for the strengthening. As we come together in the strengthening, God then comes in and blesses us with his grace, mercy, and love. With hope. He fills us up with hope. He fills up with faith. And love. And love. We can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We will continue on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. And we read in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gifts of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I'm, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is, it is not boastful. Is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self seeking, is not irritable, is not. and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, hmm, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. It will be fulfilled when the perfect one comes. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. But then Face to face. 
Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Wow, that's so beautiful right there. Now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. The glory of faith. The glory of faith. What is faith? You may ask, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. That's a powerful truth right there. The universe was created by the word of God. By the power of God. Creation happened because of the power of God's word. It, is, it was in the invisible. Things that we do not see became visible through the power of God. What is faith? Is believing by faith. It's what was not seen. Now we're seeing it in the spirit by faith in God and God alone. The universe was created by the word of God. So what is seen was made by what was not visible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 and 10, it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, Jesus, the partial will, become, will come to an end. Everything will be fulfilled because when he comes, he tells us the truth and he confirms the truth. Because if creation was created by the invisible God, <laughs> we are believing by truth that God is the one that brings all prophecy to a fulfillment. In Christ, everything is fulfilled. In Jesus, everything comes to completion through the perfect one. How many of you worship the perfect one? How many of you praise the perfect one? How many of you believe in the perfect one? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 and on, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself, God said, by my name. I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. Why? Because he has faith in God. By my word, there's nothing greater, but because you are placing your faith in me, by my word, I will bless you. When we place our faith in Jesus, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, they all come together and say, we got to bless huh, my son. We got to bless our daughter. Why? Because they've placed their faith in me, in us. Creation. Everything was created for the glory of God's name. Everything was created for the glory of God's name. And so here we see, we, we, we assume we are assured in Christ by faith. We are confident. The glory of faith is because the faithful one, Jesus, is the faithful one. Because of the faithful one, we are able to be faithful to him. He shows us his faithfulness. That is why we are able now to have faith in him and in him alone. Why are we so convinced of our faith? I mean, the world today is questioning God, questioning our faith. How can you believe in an invisible God, if that's what you call him, God? I don't see him. Where is he when catastrophe happens? Why does he permit, if he's good, bad things to happen? These are, these are the, 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 the comments the world has. Those who have not had an encounter with God. Those who the Holy Spirit hasn't revealed. But if we believe in the name of Jesus that the eyes will be open. And we declare in Jesus' name that God is calling us to use us for the glory of his name. To pray for people's eyes to be open to see the glory of his name. Creation and reality does not change. 
We don't worry about the air and the oxygen that we breathe to run out. It never runs out. We don't, we don't, we don't get concerned by, well, I hope we have oxygen tomorrow. That's something we do not control. But God gifted us to know humanity needs oxygen and air to be able to live and survive. Why? Because all of creation was created by God and he ordained and set everything to work in his function. We don't worry about air. We don't worry about, oh, well, tomorrow, I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Can we, can we save some air? No. It happens because God set it into motion. The invisible God. How, we believe because we're seeing it. How, how are we missing this? The way our body sleeps and our cells are healed as we rest. I mean, this is how our body works. God created us. How many of you know that God created us and he made us well? Say, he made me well. Say, he made me well. Come on, say it to yourself. He made me well. Our heart pumps blood through our bodies. And we continue to breathe. The function of our body is so com complex. But the Bible tells us that we are wonderfully made. It's complex, but we are what, you, we go to bed, and we don't think about, well, I hope my blood cells are, you know, they start to produce. And, you know, we know we should, we should be healed. We should be a whole. But we don't, we're not concerned about, well, I hope that my, my heart is pumping. And, no, no, it happens. And those who are sick, who become sick of these ailments, then become alert and aware, I'm, I'm not well. And so when we pray over a physical body who's not well, we're believing God to restore all things because we go back to the manufacturer. We go back to the one who created us. Lord, you created my, you created my sister. We're praying for a couple right now, uh, uh, and, and we're believing in a miracle. And every day we're believing God, restore the body, the one you created, the one. But have your way. You see, have your way, God. We pray by faith, believing that God can restore all things. But we under, also understand that God is the one that says it's time or it's not. You will live or it's time for you to go because we are living in the promises of God. But our faith is, Lord, you can lift her up. Lord, you can do it all. You can restore the heart, the brain. You can bring healing to our soul. Why? Because you created us. We don't worry about these things. A woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to another human being. Come on, mothers. How many mothers do we have in the house? I mean, how powerful is that, that, we, that, that you women can give birth? Science is trying to replicate that. Science is trying to see how we can give birth to things without having a mother. I mean, come on, somebody. The way God ordained things, the creator of all things, set things in motion, and it is perfect. If we want to see and know how things are done, come on, Holy Spirit, reveal to me your truth. You are the creator, God, but we thank you because you created things that are so wonderfully complex. No man can go through what women go through in, during birth and in labor. Come on, I don't care how strong you think you are, man. I don't care. Oh, you've never been in that, in that room. It's not fun. <laughs> God set apart each person to do what they need to do. There's a function in the man. There's a function in the woman. And if God created it, it is wonderfully made. And my faith is in God and God alone. I'm not going to question why. I'm going to believe in our creator, God. There's a modern telescope that we are all infatuated with at this moment. This telescope is seeing galaxies of thousands of years away. Stars that we've never seen before. And the world is like, wow, how amazing. You know what I think when I see these things? The glory of God. There's this star or galaxy just recently that's now in controversy. 
scientists are like figuring it out. What is this? Some pers a person said that it predates what the theory of the Big Bang theory is. So it goes further than the Big Bang theory. So the Big Bang theory is like where humanity can't come, comes from. But wait a minute, there's life before the Big Bang? That debunks everything we have believed in science. What are you saying that this is picking it up? And it's in controversy now. Is it or is it not? But that's what science is. They debate things. But the moment they take God out, they're not, magnif they're not in awe of the creation of who God is. So I believe that this telescope is up there because God has opened up. This is my opinion. My opinion. God is opening up the curtains of knowledge for humanity to see how majestic, how big and wonderful God's knowledge and wisdom is. We are not capable in our human brain to capture the greatness of God, the wisdom of God. So science, I want to show you a little bit. I know you're going to continue believing and thinking other, other things, but I want you to know that it is my glory and my power. I created all things. So I love science. We have scientists here that are, that's their daily job. I, um, I was just talking to, to an to a aerospace technician yesterday. Come on, somebody. I'm like, you're, that's impressive. Pastor, we want to come here. I was like, amen. We need smart people to prove to the world Jesus is real. God is a God of wisdom and knowledge. It's not because you are wise in your gifting that God cannot show you his glory. Christian people, we can be wise as well. You can be professionals. We have an influence in the outside world. And whatever the Lord has called you to do, do it well for the glory of God's name. We have many professionals here. We have entrepreneurs here. We have people that do all things. And, and I want you to know that your position is to show God's glory wherever God has placed you in. Be a light. Show your faith. Preach the word of God of good news. Share the story of your life. God has done it with me. I believe it. Whether you want to believe it or not, this is truth to me. And I want to invite you to my church. I want to invite you to, to meet my, 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 my church uh, 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 community. It's amazing. They're kind of crazy. They believe God for everything. But come on, let's go. <laughs> I say that we're crazy because the Bible tells us to be, to come... Jesus said, let the children come to me because theirs is the kingdom. Check this out. What Jesus is saying here, their innocence is, what, is how you need to be. Come as innocent children. Your children, if you have children, you know they believe everything and anything you say. Your children will believe everything and anything you say because they're innocent. They come to you. Ma, dad, I need. I want. And they brag. Uh, uh, uh. But they come to you. That's how we have to come to Jesus. But come to Jesus. He's not going to believe God with your innocence. God, I can't really understand, but I come to you anyways. Sometimes we stop ourselves because we can't think in our own knowledge to come to God. God, I mean, I, let me figure it out, and then I come to you. We come to God when we can't figure it out. That's the opposite. The moment you got to figure out, involve God in it. What should I do in this situation? And you may even have the answer, but bring it to God anyways. Lord, is this your will? Is this your way? Is this the way I should be acting upon this? Should I react this way? Because they should hear what they should know. I should correct them, and they should hear it from me. Lord, should that be my response? Or can you fight my battles for me? That I don't even have to speak, Lord but God, but you have met them, and they come, and we have a nice conversation. It's all over. Lord, can you do that for me? There's been time and time. I'm, I'm a person. I don't like confrontation. I don't. So I bring it to God. And when we have the conversation with the person, whatever, it's like, no, that was solved. That was good. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I mean, it's not good to always avoid, but sometimes it's good to give it to God. If you leave it to me, oh, my goodness. That's what our conviction. God sustains everything in us and outside of us. How do, how's our solar system holding together? By the power of God's word. How is my life being held together? By the power of God's word. How does my body function? By the power of God's word.
because he created us and he's in control of all things. The Bible says tomorrow is not promised for anyone, but we can, we should not be afraid of death. This is this church. Tomorrow is not promised for, any, for anyone. You can't say tomorrow you're going to wake up. You can't say tomorrow you will live another day. We can't say that. It's all by the grace and the mercy and the will of God. But we should not be afraid of death. Because why? Life is in God's hands. As Christians, as believers in Christ, we should not be afraid of death. We should, we should say, Lord, you are in control of all things. My life my family's life, my children's life, you are the one in control, and I give you the glory. Tomorrow is not promised, but it's not a verse for us to be in fear. Lord, you're sovereign, and I have faith in you. My life is in you. My life is in you. My faith is not on myself, but is on God. My faith is not on me. I believe in myself. And that's what the world says a lot. You hear that today in our culture. Believe in yourself. You can do it. Have confidence. That's what people follow. Confidence. I think is a combination. Believe and have confidence in God. And all things work together for his good. Come on. Confidence in the Lord gives us confidence. Faith in God increases our faith, and everything stems from God. You can do your job well with confidence. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. Your eyes are not on yourself. Your eyes are on the Lord. He created you. He gives you the wisdom and the knowledge. It's a gift from God. Receive it today in Jesus' name. We are created and limited in our humanity, but we are dependent on our Creator. We're limited in our wisdom. We're limited in our thought process. We're limited in our resources. But we believe and trust in the one that is unlimited in resources, in knowledge and wisdom. And we depend only and solely on him. I want to encourage you today in the name of Jesus to put your trust, your faith in Jesus. Our faith is based on his word. Our hope is relying on his promises. Our hope is relying on his promises. I want to speak to you about the glory of hope. The glory of hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. We are limited in our understanding our hope is to fully know the perfect one. Faith is like a mirror. It's a reflection of an object, but it's a reflection of an object. I, how many, if you're a driver, you know this. The mirrors are a reflection of an object that may be close to us. And, and, and at the bottom of your mirror, um, it, may, it may give you a disclosure of, it may seem closer than what it is, so be careful. So this mirror is not accurate. But it gives you a reflection of, or, or to, that, that it is there. There's an object. Be careful. Look at your rearview mirror. Look at the sides. Make sure. But it's an, you're, you're looking out. So faith is a reflection of, of what's to come. A reflection of God. It's a reflection. Faith is, I'm believing in, the, in that reflection. But it's not fully yet. But I'm believing it. There's a reflection. My faith is a reflection like a mirror, Paul says here. But it's not the full, when, he, when the perfect one comes and shows up in glory, we're going to get the full image of who he is. Right now we're getting it in impartial, but we're believing him because we're getting a reflection of who he is. And we believe it. We're seeing a reflection of God's faithfulness. We're seeing a reflection of God's mercy. We're seeing a reflection of God. He's coming, but he is coming. Church, Jesus is coming. One day we will see him face to face. We will, but, one, but when we see Face to face, that's what it means. When we see Jesus face to face, I mean, we, see, we say, I say it a lot when we do, um, we break bread, we do the Lord's uh, table, we set the Lord's table. We, we wait for you. We believe in your return. 
How many of you are excited to see Jesus face to face? How many of you are excited to see Jesus face to face? Right now we're getting a reflection, and that's our faith. It's a reflection. But one day we will have hope to see Jesus face to face. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Because God wanted to show his unchangeable purpose even more clearly than to the heirs of the promises, of the promise. He guaranteed it with an oath, with a promise, so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, God cannot lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to cease the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Praise the Lord. This anchor of our soul is firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. This is the temple. This is the glory of glory. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest hmm, forever according to the, uh, to the order of Melchizedek. God has entered into the throne of thrones, the the holy of holies, as a forerunner, my goodness, he, he has broken the veil for us then to follow. Our hope is to one day be in the presence of God forever. Jesus came to earth and he broke the veil and, he, and he, he's given us access into the presence of the Father. No one was able to go into that place. The priests were prepared beforehand. If a priest will go in there unprepared with unrepented sin that was not right unto God, he will die in the presence of God. That priest will not make it. As a matter of fact, he will walk in the, in the Holy of Holies and they will strap a bell to his ankles because he would have to be in motion worshiping the Lord and doing what he has to do in the inside. But if they didn't hear the bells, that meant that he had passed away and they would pull the string that they were also tied to the leg to bring him out because no one was able to enter the presence of God if they weren't prepared. Jesus here becomes the, the one that takes our guilt, our shame, and we are able to go into the presence of the Father. Why? Because Jesus made a way. It is through Jesus' blood, because our belief in Jesus, that we're able to have life and life in abundance is no longer the way the Old Testament did it. It's the new covenant in Jesus. Come on, somebody. It is through the blood of Jesus that we enter freely into his presence. Our forgiveness comes from the Lord. Us believers have to always have our hope in Jesus. It's not about how our religious acts, <laughs> our duties that we do. Thank God for all those, th that service. But I want one day for the Lord to say, welcome, good and faithful servant. Instead of, I never knew you. But Lord, I prophesied in your name. I did this in your name. And he tells us, but where was your discipline in my presence? It's not about doing. It's about spending time in the presence of God. It's about worshiping the living God. And we're believing God to take us from glory to glory. We're believing God to take us from glory to glory. There is hope for our life. It is an anchor to our soul. We are secured in our hope in Jesus. It's an anchor. We are secured. We don't have to go anywhere. We trust in the Lord always with everything because he holds us firm. We are secured 
in our hope in Jesus. This hope carries us through every moment of our lives. This hope is the one that when we see the impossible, no, 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 my hope is in the Lord. I trust the Lord with everything. We go through heartbreaks, disappointments, trauma, job loss, loss in the family, etc. You name it. We're human. We go through it. Somebody backstabbed you. They lied about you. Yeah, it happens. Even in church. Hello, somebody. Somebody needs a testimony. <laughs> and everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. But through it all, our hope is in the Lord. No matter what we are going through, no matter how many people have cheated on you, no matter how bad or traumatizing your trust or taint that your trust has become, man, trust in the Lord always. Trust in the Lord always. Mm. Faith and hope is possible through the love of God. Faith and hope is possible through the love of God. And this we speak of the glory of love. The glory of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We love because God loves and check this out, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. Go, let's go back there. We're going to remain there. And th these verses are, I, I read it a lot at, at weddings, when we do wedding ceremonies and everything. And, but, but this is referring to the church. This, these verses here is pertaining to the church. How we should act with one another. Because this is how Jesus is. If Jesus does it, we should do it. How many of you want to be like Jesus? Not be God, but like him. Come on, somebody. I want the characters of Jesus. I'm not God. He is. But I want to be like him. I want to be an imitator of Jesus. And here, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 and on. It says, And I, if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, when I have love, I've gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. And does not keep a record of wrongs. Thank you, Jesus. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, hmm, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I want to say this. God never ends. There's no beginning <laughs> and there's no end to God. He always was, he will be, and forever and ever and ever, he will be God, seated on his throne. And if he's seated on his throne, his church will be going from glory to glory. If we are believing in God for his hope, his faith, and his love to live in us, we will be going from glory to glory. Life will hit. But when life hits, we depend on him. We will love. We will not get irritable. No matter what has happening around us, hold yourself. Lord, I need you now. I want to be like Jesus. You know what you did to me five years ago? It does not keep record of wrong. But I thought we went past that. Mm. God forgives. Do we forgive? God keeps no record of wrong. You remember what you did to me? Let me get my phone now. Oh, because I remember. Oh, Jesus, help us. Are we, are we saying to be perfect? Nope. 
we're saying to ask the Lord for help in every situation of your life because we depend on Jesus. We need him. And one day you will get out of, we, us Christians, people, we say, don't make me go to my old man. Don't, I mean, don't let me go back to my, when I used to, and, yo, calm down. God, if God, God made you new. You are a new creation in Jesus. Don't remember your past. Know that God made you new. You are not that person. You are a living new creation in Jesus Christ. How many of you give God thanks for a new creation? You have become a new creation. We're baptizing a few people in a few moments. And the Bible says that they're going from death to life. Because of a confession they made to Jesus. I believe in you and trust in you. So what we're seeing is a public declaration on what they have declared on the inside of their spirit. Lord, I'm not perfect, but you are the perfect one. I don't know how to love, but teach me how to love. Lord, I'm not faithful, but you are. I want to grow in my faith. I want to believe all things. I want to trust in all things. I want to be like you, Jesus. And we, the church, cheer them on. Come on, come on, come on. How many of you can... As a matter of fact, we are here to cheer each other on. We are the church. We ask for prayers. We're not perfect. We need each other in love, in hope, and in faith. My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. God is love. And if this is how God is, that's how I want to be. Jesus died on our behalf to save us from sin and death to offer us eternal salvation, for God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. I'm giving you a lot of scripture. Why? Because I don't want it to be my words. I want you to carry the word of God wherever you go. And this book is accessible to you everywhere you go. Come on. Even an app was created with all versions you need to read. However you want to read it, but read it. Read it. Make notes. What was that verse that pastor spoke about? Read it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Continue to read the word of God. The more you read the word of God, the more you learn how to listen to the voice of God. How many of you understand that? You want to know God? Learn how he speaks through his word. And he will open up the heart, the desire, the hunger through the Holy Spirit to continue to seek him more and more. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, it says, This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. That's powerful right there. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and believe and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because he is. Because as as he is, so also are we in this world. We're imitators of Jesus. Come on, somebody. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. We don't fear the coming of the Lord. We're confident in him. We know that the day of judgment is coming, but I am confident in God because my salvation is in him. I'm secured in Jesus. I don't have to worry about the trumpet sounding. Am I ready? No, no, no. I'm confident that if the trumpet sounds, if the coming of the Lord is now, I'm ready to go with him. Why? Because I'm confident in him. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. Hmm. Fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. Church, 
before you were born, God loved you. Because he is love. We love because he loves. If we're not in Jesus, it's impossible for us to love. Because God is love. And if he lives in us, we will never, he will never leave us and he will never abandon us. Why? Because he is love. He cares for you. If you love a person, hmm, truly love, you will do everything possible to be with them. Everything, if it's true love. And true love is respectful. True love honors. True love is honest. True love corrects, but changes as well. If you're married and your spouse asks you of something that is bothering him or her, honor, respect. That's us showing love if we truly love, but we can't love if we're not in Jesus. You can't expect a person to change overnight if God doesn't come in. God has to come in and dwell in the hearts of humanity. And if we confess him as our Lord and Savior, he comes in to have relationship with us. He teaches us all things. He teaches us how to be faithful, how to love. I used to be, but I am new in Jesus. I used to be, but I'm new in Jesus. How many of you are being blessed today? The only way we can truly love is by understanding and receiving the love of Jesus. You and I today can go from glory to glory in Jesus. We can go from glory to glory in Jesus. This message is may sound simple, but so profound because the anchor of our soul has to be Jesus. Not humanity, not the world, not the government, not your job, because one day your job says deuces. And then what? No, no. My provider is Jesus. He will open up another door. I will be in peace. Why? Because he's my provider. My life doesn't depend on my degree, how smart I am, how wise I am, how many followers I have on Instagram. Some people are driven by those numbers. Huh. We follow people. Oh, wow, they have 4,000, 14,000. I want to follow them too. They must be important. And that's how we've been wired. We've been caught up in an algorithm. The more you watch, the more it feeds you of what you watch. We're in a system. It's like this matrix type of thing. How do we get out of it? You know how do you get out of this matrix? By opening up our spiritual eyes through the power of the Holy Spirit and waking up to the reality that True life is not what we see in front of us. True life is dependent on the invisible God. When the Holy Spirit opens up our eyes, we're like, where was I all my life? And we find joy, we find peace that is overwhelming. And you, I, I would never be able to say hello to a person with a smile on my face. Me trust, it only, is only God. And that's your story. Because when God comes in, he makes all things new. We're going from glory to glory. In conclusion, John chapter 3, verse 14. And usually we, we say John 3, 16. But I want us to read in context what's happening here. In John 3, 14 through 17. Check this out. And the worship team can come. Let's go. Join me. It's powerful. We're going to go into baptism soon. I'm excited. John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way, 
he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He sent his only son so that we can be saved only through Jesus. The world wants to think and say otherwise. But we, the church, are anchored and secured that our salvation only comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. He died on the cross to set us free from eternal condemnation, to give us eternal salvation. One day we will not see a reflection of who Jesus is, but we will see him fully in front of us. And we, the church, say, come, God. Come, Jesus. We are waiting for you because we know that you are with us. Our trust is in the Lord. And church, I want us to go from glory to glory. The Holy Spirit is leading us and wants us to go from glory to glory. I'm wanting what God wants. Our vision is God's vision. It's his vision. Not what I want to do. Not what makes me comfortable. Is what gives God the glory is what honors him and in him alone. And when I see even one person being baptized, even one person giving their life to Jesus, even one person saying, I need Jesus, I need prayer. We've done what we are called to do to proclaim the good news of salvation because everyone who confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior will be saved.